Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Spanning the Need. I'm your host, Anthony Spano. Tonight, we're going to talk about education. And to do that with us tonight is the CEO of the Youngstown City Schools, Justin Jennings. Justin, thank you for joining me tonight. Hey, thank you for having me, Anthony. Well, it, we're, we talk a lot about schools and education because there's a lot going on with the pandemic and kind of what what has been good and bad because of the pandemic, of going to school, online learning. And we'll get into a little bit about that. But what I think I want people to understand is kind of your background, your journey from where you are to kind of how you came to Youngstown. So give a little bit of, get, yeah, yeah. Give a little bit of background about like your education background, kind of coming all the way to the city of Youngstown. All right. Yep. I am a, actually, this is my 23rd year in education. So I've been around for a long, long time. I am a, a originally from Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm not a U of M fan for all Ohio State fans out there, so you don't have to get off the uh, podcast. I actually graduated from Purdue University. I went to Purdue University on a full basketball scholarship. I was there for four years. Um, I was part of the uh, Big Ten, uh, three Big Ten championship teams in a row. A lot of great basketball players with me. Um, I am a, a father, a grandfather. My Youngest is 21. My oldest is 28, and I have a four-year-old grandson. So it's kind of there. Um, my educational journey is is a long one. That's why I had to look like, whoa, how long? How much time do we have today? So I started off as a special ed teacher back in about 1999, and um, in the suburbs. I mean, in Grand Rapids Public Schools. Um, from there, uh, I I worked as a assistant principal. After my uh, teacher, I was assistant principal, a dean of students, a principal. Um, I worked um, as an executive principal, which is a, which is a little weird. We can get in that later if you want to. Then I uh, moved on to be an assist, a special ed director, special ed supervisor. Then I was assistant superintendent of curriculum, and then I became a superintendent. And after that, after my a couple of years of uh, superintendency, I, I, I was uh, named the CEO here. So, kind of a that's kind of my journey in a, in a quick way. Well, and if is it is it true that you have three master's degrees? I I do I do have three master's degrees. That that's one of those um, not urban legends. It uh, it was one of those things where I was a first college, a first generation college student, and I didn't know any better. So as I started going through, and I got one master's, I got the next one, and got the next one. And then after I got done with everything, somebody just told me, "Hey, you know, you, after your master's, you're supposed to get your doctorate, right?" And yeah, so that's that's where we are right now. So I'm, I'm actually finish up finishing up my doctorate right now at U of M. So. Well, it, we're we're glad to have you in the city of Youngstown. You've been here since August of 2019. What kind of made you come to the city? What was really exciting to bring you here? Well, first of all, the, the challenge. My my work has always been a a turnaround principal or a turnaround administrator, so a turnaround superintendent. And and the and the position we 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 had similar positions in Michigan, but in Michigan they were called emergency managers, and they weren't met with great fanfare. So I kind of had a a, a I, I looked at this situation before I got here, and and I think it was it's important. Those positions were a little different, in which all the emergency managers in Michigan never were educators, but they were over a school district. So it was sort of ran. The school district was ran like a business. So it was how okay. can we save money and do this, and it wasn't. And their focus wasn't on how can we help our our our, our scholars. And I and I and I think that's something important to bring. Out. I don't I don't call our students students. I call them scholars because they're there to learn. And, and there is no negative connotation for a scholar. You'd never heard somebody say, well, that's a dumb scholar or that scholar is not smart or anything like that. So that's the reason why we, we use that term. And so um, actually, my story is a little crazy. I, I, we on a, we on a podcast, so this not, may not be good. Somebody will come back and see it later. But actually, hey, uh, it's live. We're <laughs> live. I know. You know what? I I, um, I was getting married at the time and my fiance lived in, in Cleveland and um, we were uh, and I wanted to I wanted to. I wanted to move. I, I was I've been in Michigan pretty much my whole life, and then when, when we started looking at jobs, um, this was one, this was one that I saw, and I was like, man, this is this is like my dream job. This is what I've, I've been building up to do, and it gave me the opportunity to move here. So when I, those two things combined were, were really the reason how how we got here, and, and I really think the challenge of um, being the CEO in that role is something that intrigued me. But when I got here, that totally changed. I mean, there's a, I have so much love for Youngstown and I, I can still see the growth. And it, it's, it's been great because for anybody who's from Youngstown, you, you, I don't, especially in Youngstown city schools, you know, people 
and you know if there's a young, they're a Youngstown person by where they went to school at. So I tell people I, I'm from Michigan, and if you ever meet anybody from Detroit, and they tell you from there, they're from Detroit, they're not from Detroit. They're gonna tell you what side of Detroit they're from if they're actually really genuinely from Detroit. And the same thing from here. If you're a graduate or you're from Youngstown, they normally tell you what high school they went to. They don't tell you I'm from Youngstown. They'll say that, hey, I'm from D Rand or I'm from, you know, I'm from Wilson or I'm from this. So that's kind of kind of how, how we 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 just I just love the city and, and I really see not only the growth of our education, but the growth of our city. But actually a, a lot of people have a lot of negative connotations about Youngstown City Schools, but what they don't realize is growth, economic growth and schools go hand in hand because businesses, Amazon, Starbucks, Google, they won't go to places in which they don't have talent that's local. They don't want people to drive from 50 minutes around to come work you know, at Google or come work at Amazon. They want people who are in the city. That means that we have to make sure that our scholars are um, ready to be able to work to help the workforce. And, and I think that's something important. And, and, you know, as much as I do being working with those companies, Google and just kind of they want a workforce, they want an educated workforce. And I think that's what sometimes people, like you said, look shy away from Youngstown because of the declining population and a variety of other things that are that are going on. It's just almost like a domino effect. Right. Absolutely. And, and like I said, I'm, I'm from Grand Rapids. And, and if anybody does any research, Grand Rapids used to be just like Youngstown. It was an old. That is founder. correct. And it's it's totally totally reinvented itself. Like I, I go home every now and then because my dad um is still there. My mom passed away in 2013, but like I'm I'm actually going home for Memorial Day to spend time with my dad. And because I'm so tall, you because I'm in the top this you can't really see me because I'm so tall. My dad moved and he lives in an apartment, and I I used to come and sleep on the couch, but it hurts so bad. So now I always stay at a hotel. And the crazy thing is like when I was in Grand when I was growing up. They were like, you may have a holiday in, you had the Amway Grand Plaza if you really wanted to do something nice. But I just looked the other day at hotels and there's like a JW Marriott, there's the Embassy Suites. I'm like, these things were never around. So, but just to see Grand Rapids, the, the Phoenix of from Grand Rapids, how it went from basic to ashes to what it is right now. I, I see the same thing with, with the right people and the right leadership and really the right attitude that Youngstown can be. The same thing. It, it, there, it's 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 really. I don't want to say it's a blank canvas. It's a canvas because the work has already started. But now we have to get the people to believe in, in what we can do and what's going on. Well, and I think you you bring up a good point. Is and did I did my research? Grand Rapids was in the same predicament in the downtown area that Youngstown was about ten years ago, and now you're starting to see both Grand Rapids kind of re reinvent itself in a variety of different ways, and you see Youngstown doing the exact same, but in different areas. We're kind of looking at more of a techno technological hub and they're looking at more of an inventing type of small business and, and type of that. So you see both sides of it. So you know what Youngstown's about because of the grit, because everyone, yeah, like you said, I'm from the RAN or, <laughs> or yeah, they'll, they'll add like the Ohio State Buckeyes or right. so, and, but, but you got to admit people, really have it for for the city they, as much as i mean we had 150,000 people 20 years ago uh with the steel mills and people i mean i meet people all the time i i live in the city and you say, oh i used to live on the east side i used to live on the west side so you still get those people that really want to give back but i think sometimes don't know how because i think they think there's so much going on there depending on what you see with violence or economic growth or, or a variety of different things. Absolutely. And I think that that's something that that's really important because we, we have to accentuate the positives and not the negatives. So, I mean, make, make it be known. And there's, there's no mistake that, that we have a lot of violence that is going on in our city right now, and especially among our youth. But what I always say to people when they say that they want to solve it, the first thing they have to do to begin to solve it is they actually have to talk to the youth and understand what the problem is. The second thing is when they do talk to them, they have to have action towards what they're talking about. A, a lot of our, a lot of the activities that we have is because there's nothing, no activities really for our kids to do. I mean, you, you think about that. When I grew up in, in Grand Rapids, we went swimming every single day. There was 15, 16 swimming pools across the city of Grand Rapids that, that we went, I mean, we went swimming every day. We played basketball or we played football, we played baseball after we went swimming. There was always something to do. It was always something to keep us busy. And I, 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 
I was at the beginning of the video game era. So we used to play with the little one joystick and an Atari. Yeah. When it was the Atari. Cold right. When it was cold outside, we, we, we did play video games, but it wasn't the same. We went outside and played and it's, it's just a different time. So we have to help our, our children adapt to what's going on, but also we have to show them, Hey, there are things that you can do besides what you're doing now. I mean, I, when I'm walking around the schools or I'm talking to kids and they're they're so intense with each other and they're having these conversations, I'm like, man, what are you talking about? Oh, it, and I'm thinking they're talking about a video game. I mean, I'm thinking they're talking about playing physical, physically playing basketball. Like, oh, we're talking about the video game. We're talking about Fortnite. And I'm thinking like, man, you are so enthusiastic and it's not even a physical activity. I mean, but it's something mental. But you know, our generation, we can't necessarily relate because we want them to be the way we were. But times have changed. They, they need something different. Well, I think I think you, you bring up a good point is you have a lot of these youth that have the PlayStations, they play online, they're playing with people all over the world. And I think and I, I was kind of the Atari. And then when it snowed, I'd go outside and we would get a four wheeler and then put a slide, a sled on the end of it. And that just didn't work out at some times. <laughs> but I think what what we look at is these kids that are if you look at it, games are more of mental. Mm -hmm physical knowing what to do so you're actually using it to your benefit and it helps in a variety of different ways so it's just not that they're playing video games right. they're using a lot of their different functions so how do we take that 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 um energy that they have and turn it into something great as you as we hope right i i think the first thing we have to do is we have to we have to get them to into education because they understand what we need to do more but also look at they can be educated the way that we we were educated because times are different. I mean, I always tell the story when, when I was in school and I was getting, as you already explained, we're getting one of my three master's degrees. I never forget it. One of my first days of class, my teacher pulled out this overhead projector and he had slides. And I'm thinking in my head like, no, 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 this can't be true. I can't be learning like this. But those are the those are things that happen. And it's not that as we get older, as educators we can't do do things but we have to we have to make some we have to adapt to what the what our scholars are doing i mean they learn using this this is how they learn so if we can't teach with technology which leads to our, our COVID conversation we had to do something different because our children ha they had to learn with technology where the problem was the adults hadn't caught up our, our students didn't, didn't have a problem with online learning like everybody think because this is what they use every day in order to communicate. It's how they talk. It's how they think. It's how they communicate. But as adults, I mean, I, I still know people who still have a landline. If you have a landline now and, and that's what you use primarily, it's a problem. It's, it's a serious problem. So but um, that's what, one thing that we definitely learned during the during COVID time that, that technology and learning with technology is, is so important. When I started in education, well, in if, if you go back about 15 years ago and you got a degree online, it was so taboo. You couldn't get a job anywhere. Well, now that is correct. Right. That is correct. Because some of them weren't accredited. Correct. But now it, you, you can't take a, you can't get a degree in college at any level and not have some sort of online piece to it. I mean, whether it's Blackboard, whether it's something else, there's always an online piece. So like I said, the colleges and university had to adapt to education, but we still in edu in, in our K-12 or pre-K-12 setting, we still have it. Well, and, and that, I mean, you bring up a good point. I just finished my master's in, uh, in mind last year was all online because right. of the pandemic. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the pandemic because I think every educator, every every person in the United States pretty much went online overnight. Mm -hmm. Talk about how that changed. What, what was going through your mind when you guys, hey, all schools got to go online now. We're closing the schools. Uh, what, what was going through your mind? Like, because I, I think what people don't understand is what educators were actually going through that first couple, that first month kind of going into it. I think it's like, oh, they just turned on a system and, and that was it. But I know as an educator, as well as working in the system in the past, it's this is not how it is. Well, that question is interesting because I think my, my mindset was different from most people. And uh, I got ostracized for, for my decisions and the d decisions I made initially after that first um, pretty much month or so of uh, of COVID. So so I, I kind of I'm 
my thoughts are always organized and I'm still a pencil and paper user. So I never forget that I sat down. I'm like, how, are, how am I going to figure this out? And how am I, how am I going to get the message to the people who work under me to believe in what I'm doing? So my three pronged approach was, and I know this is going to be controversial, but I'm going to say it. Education was number three. Educating our kids was number three. First and foremost was keeping everybody safe. That was first and foremost to be me. Number two was to make sure that our scholars were still fed because I know what that is. Yeah. A lot of people don't people don't agree or don't understand. Youngstown City School District is the poorest district in the country. Not the state, not just the state of Ohio, right. not on whatever statistics they may have put together. We were the poorest district in the country. That means that if if our scholars are not at school, they may not have a meal. So number one was like I said, safety of everybody. Number two was fed, being that they that they um, have shelter or be fed. And then the last thing was how do we educate them? So that's the, the approach we took, which is you know later on down the line, I never real, I never strayed away from that. And like I said, I caught a lot of flack um, publicly. I caught a lot of flack privately. I had a lot of phone calls where people were saying, man. You have the courage that I wish that I had because I know you just know that you're doing the right thing. I know you're getting beat up now, but just know you're doing the right thing. And then once we once we got to almost the end of the school year, to me, it didn't make sense to transition our kids back into school because of politics. And and that was the thing that, that was for me. It was it, it, I know that people want, want to get back to normalcy so bad, but you we didn't want to get back to normalcy, normalcy to the point of people would get sick again. And, and for me, some of the things, some of my decisions were also personal. Our, our first week or so of, of um, our quarantine in, in last March, one of my central office people passed away from COVID. So it put the perspective differently, probably from what other people who who didn't have that experience. And, and, and he was well known. He was in the district for over 50 years and he passed away. I mean, I remember... I, he didn't even know he was sick because that was at a time where people were kind of running all over helter skelter. There weren't really tests. And I remember talking to him and I was like, Hey, you got to stay home. You can't, you can't come. I'm, I, and at the time, like I said, we didn't know he had COVID. We just knew he was sick. I said, just stay home, you know, get your, get yourself together and relax. And then the next day came and I, I called him just to check on him. Cause that's me. I checked Hey, how are you doing? He's like, I'm not doing well. I said, if you're not doing well, you need to, you need to get to the hospital because we don't know what's going on. Next day he goes to the hospital, get a call, no, no answer. Then I find out, hey, such as I don't want to say the name, but such as has, has COVID, Fine. he's in the hospital. And then days progress, maybe a couple of days later, they had to invert him because you know with, with COVID it attacks your system. Next thing I know, he was gone. So from there, it was like, I gotta put this in perspective because my job is not only to make sure all of our scholars are educated, which is number one and the most important, but I also have now my 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 job is I have to make sure everybody's safe. And yes, the students needed to be safe. I get that. And that was primary, but also the adults, because now we found out as time went, we kind of found out how the disease, I mean, how COVID spread. And at the time, a lot of the research was like, young people probably won't get it, but they are absolutely carriers of it. So there's another factor that came into play for me. About 40% of all of my students in my and all my scholars in our district live with somebody who's 55 or older. So now I wasn't only concerned about those students coming to school, maybe, you know, atypical or maybe a carrier, but now they're bringing it home, which now it becomes a community problem. So I, I slept well, you know, I took a lot, I took a lot of punches, but I slept well because I knew and I, I felt as though I was doing the right thing. And, and I still, you know, to this day, I still think that I did. I, get, I still get, a lot of flack from our seniors because they missed out on a lot of stuff that, that they could have done. But we we did allow sports. We did a lot of testing. People didn't like it. We had schools who wouldn't play us because we were testing our kids. So they knew that if we were testing our kids, we didn't have anybody on that floor who had COVID. And if they got COVID, it came from them. So we had sport. We have athletic events where people wouldn't even play against us because they weren't testing. So th I think that that was just important. It was important for us to do, and I think even to this day, it's the right thing for. It was the right thing for us to do, and today was the well, last. I, by the way, so that that was that was. What was today? I'm sorry. Today was the last day of school, so next year we we start we start back in person again. But today was the last day of school, so that that was it was awesome to finally kind of get that that monkey off our back.
Well, and, and, and yeah, I, I, that would after one of the probably the most dramatic last year and a half that that the uh, and the seniors hopefully got what their full experience that any senior class would normally get to a to a to as normal as you can get. Right. Right. To the best well, of our ability. So, yeah. Well, and I think you, you bring up a good point is, I mean, the kids kid ain't going to learn if he's if he's not eating properly. Correct. And, and I, I don't and, and I don't. It, and I don't understand. I'm sorry. Let me say that. I understand that point because I mean, trust me. When I when I can't eat, I, I can't function right. I mean, that's, I think that's almost anyone. And and I think it it brings in a a, a couple different scenarios in that regard. So and, and I I understand. When you when you went to online, how did you guys go to online? Well, we we started. Um... Excuse me. We did not start online because we we weren't like I, I think like every other school district in the country, unless they had an online presence and they had um, laptops for everybody, we weren't prepared to go online. So we actually started pencil and paper, and it it was a struggle. It it, it was a huge struggle. But what we did was I made the decision after uh, that person's death that we were going to prepare to be online for next year. Now whether we did or not, we were going to prepare. So. That third week, second week of March, I mean, that second week of being out in March, we were ordering laptops. When other people were talking about it, we were doing it. So when school came back around, we had our laptops when other people were just in, in, in the process of ordering them. So we were prepared from there. And then from there, we knew we were in Youngstown. We talked about poverty. That's always in mind. So we, I, I thought to myself, what it, what's the, and, and, to, and talking to my team and really some community members too. Samantha Turner over at Rotary helped us out tremendously. But I was saying, what is the point of giving a student a laptop if they don't have the access to use it? So that was the next step for us. We got the laptops or iPads, Chromebooks, all those different things we ordered. But now we have to get internet access. So what do we do? So we decided that we were going to use money before ESSER 1 came out. We were going to use school money in order to provide internet access for all of our scholars. So but the first, our first priority was to to provide hardwire access for them because you you can have a phone, you can have other things. It's not necessarily as fast, especially a lot of our families have like three or four um, um, scholars in their in their um, household. So if you got three people online and they're streaming and they're video video streaming with their teacher, <laughs> if it's not hardwired, it's going to be difficult. So that was our next thing. So our next thing, we work with AT and T, we work with Spectrum, we work with Armstrong, who um, who can give us the best uh, service, quality of service, and who can provide this. So we ended up um, working with Spectrum, and for all those families who had the ability to have internet access in their house hardwired, they got it. There were some caveats. We had some things we had to work out at first because you know the the um the company didn't want if, if somebody had an outstanding bill or you know they, they currently had internet access. They weren't allowing us to give like pay for that or give it to them for free. So after about a, a month or so working with them, they, they relented and they realized how important this was. So then for all those students who didn't have that ability, we made sure that we tried to make sure that each student had at least one to two hotspots in their household. If they had like five kids, then we gave them three or four hotspots. If they had two, we you know we may have given them two, but for the majority they they got one. But they were really powerful. So we wanted to make sure that that they got the device and they also had internet access. And also because we made that decision early, we also spent the summer training our our teachers. So because a lot of our te um, the majority of our teachers are have been in the school district fifteen years or longer. So. They weren't in school when computers were you, you were you were learning to teach with computers. So we had to step back. We taught the Google platform. We taught the Apple platform. We have we, we have some phenomenal, phenomenal trainers. Tiffany Trella in, in our um, technology department is phenomenal with educational training. So so we, we had the formula to really figure this out. And we actually um, created a online learning uh, plan. We had to create one by the state. And the one that we used, we gave it out to anybody who wanted it. We wanted, I mean, it, it wasn't, it's not a competition thing. It's about everybody learning and understanding this is what's best for our kids at this, at this point, And we'll move from there. Well, we, we talk about, we talk about different things with computers and everything because computers have kind of always been in our, in some form, shape or form with, uh, with, but not to the capacity of, I mean, you have how many students, how many oh. students that got computers? About forty eight hundred. So you so you basically ordered forty eight hundred computers 
for all well, those kids in the fall, give or take. Yeah, yeah, we we actually ordered probably about six thousand because we knew the you know breakage and adding new students. We actually ended up with more about two hundred more students than we started off with because we decided to go early. And and some people districts some districts never stopped going to school. They made that little march period, but some went right back. And we had, we actually had a lot of we had some teachers who brought their children into the district because that because of that on, online learning component. Well, in in. Do they get to keep those computers by chance? They they will have those computers through their whole career. So what we're doing is we have to uh, do some maintenance on the computers. So we did collect the computers back for maintenance. But if they are going to our summer enrichment program, then they'll 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 get that computer back, even though part of it is in person. So our our goal is for them to be able to have the computer and it's theirs. But with, with, with rules, we can't give them a computer with, with, because we the way we purchase them with with school funds. But but essentially, that computer follows them until it becomes obsolete and we replace them. Okay. What? So let, let's talk. Let's talk. Uh, you came out with an announcement. I I, I, I would say a, a week or two ago, maybe about restructuring the school district. Mm -hmm. So let me. So I want to make sure I'm I'm clear on this. So a couple years before before you got here, they restructured some of the schools back mm -hmm. then. And now you're, you're proposing a new restructure plan with, correct me if I'm wrong on this. It looks like you're going to have six pre-kindergarten to fifth grade schools, two sixth to eighth grade middle schools, a fifth to eight early college alternative and some other traditional high schools and, and the early college. Right. What do you think this will do to improve the city schools, because I this is a pretty extensive restructuring that I've I haven't seen in a long time. Well, first of all, I got to say to you, you are very thorough. I I love that about you that you're very thorough. But um, this is a, this is basically a traditional system, and, and and I have nothing against anybody who was previously here. But the system that we the, the that that K through eight system is dip is a difficult system unless you're in a Montessori system. And what we found is a lot of our um, emotionally our um, middle age or our middle school children, six through eight, they kind of struggle with maturity and transition because they, you don't have to make that transition. So now they get to high school and they're shell shocked because they've been the king of the mountain for so long. So we, what we wanted to do from an educational standpoint, when you look at curriculum, there's really no sixth grade elementary curriculum. So even though we put a lot of a lot of emphasis on elementary schools being a sixth grade, really sixth grade is a middle school. It's a transition. And and, and the model that we're using is actually the model that was used when my parents were in school. It's not even I I went into middle school because middle school was they had this little time where middle well middle school kind of transitioned to being the seventh and eighth grade. But but I, I took we went back to a model that I think works for us because it gives us the opportunity to make sure we are solid on our curriculum and our teaching and learning for our scholars. So that pre K through five building is is, is actually it mirrors the curriculum that we, we use as well. And then the six through eight building mirrors the curriculum we use. And, and then the high school, you have the high school. But something special for us about the six through eight building is we want to add more of the CTE programming into what we're doing. We have a gym in it, kind of like the city of Youngstown. We have a gym in our school district, which is Chauvin. But as you, um, but we weren't using it. And, and by the time our scholars got there, it was, they were in 11th grade. So they never got exposure. So we want to give them the opportunity to exposure. I, I tell my own kids, man, I, I, if I could have been, I, pl some plumbers make just as much money as me. But I was, but if you're never exposed and you don't understand that your aspirations is to be a football player, a basketball player, or or something like that, because that's what you see, or a rapper, or a singer, because that's what you see every day. But when you go back and you look at the economics, or you look at your skill set, some some of our scholars are going to be great at hands on. But guess what? They're, we don't have any classes like that. When you look at our curriculum, and this is across the country, when you look at curriculum in elementary school, elementary schools in an urban school setting, they don't have really a a science or social studies. They're on the other side of each other. So if on Thursday you get you get history, then that next Thursday you're you're gonna get you know science. And it's not every day. So those are things that we wanted to to kind of take apart and put back together. So now our scholars have um the ability to be exposed to those things. I mean, I'm not opposed to testing. I think there has to be some accountability. But here's my opposition, and I'm gonna say this controversially, and I don't care who who hears it. You, you can't you can't test 
students when you know they're not prepared because of other things. We blame, we don't want to fix education, so we blame it on poverty and vice versa. We don't want to fix, I said that wrong, we don't want to fix poverty, so we blame it on the education system. But you can go anywhere in the country to any urban school district, but get this, a rural school district as well, and you know what those results are going to be because they don't have the supplies, they don't have the abilities to do what they need to do in, in, in certain instances. And and I'm sorry, you, you, I, I knew we weren't getting political, but our my profession in education is the only profession that's legislated by people who know nothing about poli- I mean, know nothing about educated education, and and, and people people win. Uh, uh, platforms. They win positions based on their position in education, but they've never been in the classroom. We we have local people who talk about the things that we do. I invite them all the time, just like I'll invite you. Come into our school. It's so different. I, I'll never forget this story, and he won't be mad for me telling. Tim Ryan came to our school, and, and we talked. He came to our high school, and he was like, wow. He was like, this is crazy. This is nothing like what I heard. I was like, and I'm thinking like, yeah, I know. That's why I'm glad that you came. So we invite we invite our, our, our people to come to actually see what we're doing. It's not some what what people perception is. There's somebody violent or kids running around in the hallway out of control. That's that's not the case at our schools. They they are there are there there's a lot of learning that's going on, and there's teachers who are dedicated. There's administrators who dedicated who are dedicated and they care. Well, I think because you you hit a great point is you hear those stories about people running in the halls or you hear in the news about certain things over the years about failing schools and and failing this. And how do you keep Youngstown, city of Youngstown education and really, really move it to the next level? Because you've heard all those stories in the past that resonate to, you have a Congressman who shows up and thought, this is nothing like, this is nothing like it it was. And and you kind of got to change the momentum of once something gets out there, it's hard to change. Right. Well, well, what we try to do is just be transparent in what we're doing. So people see the dollars we're spending. They see they see how we're trying to do things. I mean, one, one of the things that, that I know you said you asked a question later, but one of the things that I pride myself on is we passed a we passed a levy in Youngstown at a percentage that almost unheard of. I mean, if you if you go back and you look at the last 10 or 15 years, levies in in a place like Olentangy, which is which is a really uh, a ritzy area over in the Columbus area, and and they have a lot of money. They their their millage passed at like fifty five percent. We were almost at sixty five percent when we passed our millage, which for me is it, saying that the community is buying into what we're trying to do. And, and and I take that more of transparency. We're not spending money frivolous, uh, frivolously. We're not a. Uh, 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 Putting up Taj Mahal's to put a, a, the CEO in this in this central office is built of glass. We're doing things that that, that help our scholars, and we also we we're, we're trying to make sure that we pay our teachers a, a fair, good wage. That's something different. We just we negotiated our first contract in almost nine years. We since I've been here the last two years, we, we're going to end in the in the black for this. I think this will be the the second year straight. So, cause this is my second year. So this will be the second year straight that we're going to end in the black. So we're, we're, we're being fiscally responsible with the funds and we're not, we're not laying off a whole bunch of people. I mean, we're doing it, looking at how we spend money and how it's going to affect our scholars and how it's going to affect the classroom, but also showing the community, this is what we're doing. There's always, you know, little instances out there where people hear something and they run with it because it's what they are. Just like the rumor, <laughs> the last couple couple weeks is we hired a new um, high school uh, football and basketball coach. We're paying them ninety thousand dollars. Well, I'm an athlete, and guess what? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not dumb enough to pay anybody to coach ninety thousand dollars. Now, if you if you came in with a Nike sponsorship and you were you you're at a major university now, that's chump change. But for us, that's not it. Our coaches have jobs during the day. We pay them for their jobs during the day. And by the way, that coach is not not only has he coached college. Uh, he, he's been a coach in college. He, he was also a principal before with a master's degree, and he's also an army veteran. So if anybody can challenge me on hiring somebody with those qu- type of capabilities who can work with our kids from from eight o'clock in the morning to four o'clock, then I, I mean, I can't I, I won't argue with you because I can't beat you anyway. Well, and, and if, if anyone and if anyone wants to do their due diligence to be on to be to be honest, all public schools are public entities. So. Mm-hmm. All you have to really do is, hey, I want a public records request for salaries. And and you have to provide that within a specific time period. So right. if someone really wants to know, it's public information. 
<laughs> well, the interesting part is for us, they don't even really have to ask anymore because we, w when we hire somebody, it, it's it's on our board agenda. It's going to be on, mm -hmm. on our agenda. So it wasn't something that we were doing before, but starting next month, it is something we're doing because and th that particular incident with which I, which I just explained precipitated that. So if people want to, and, and I feel bad for the people who are working, but if, if for the people we hire, but if you want to know when we hire somebody, here's what they, here's what their name is. I'm not giving their address, of course, but here's their name. Right, it's right. Just, with, which we have it's public information anyway so there's nothing we we do that can't be asked asked for if, if i mean if if my one of my principals spend money on a credit card man you can ask for that and you can see what they spent the money on we should be able to write down to the receipt so those those are things we, we don't hide so but we live in an era where um facebook and social media for the most part it is is the is the new nightly news it's the new tom brokaw and anybody can put anything out and and unless somebody fact check fact checks it, then it, it's gold until somebody proves it wrong. And I agree with that. And I think I'm a person of of true facts. I like to do my due diligence, as you pretty much already are aware. Mm -hmm. And I think one one thing that really jumps out when you talk about positions and students and and how you brought students back into the district is over the years the floodgates have kind of opened up that because of open enrollment to certain districts, students have left the city of Youngstown. I think at one point um, there was, uh, I'm not gonna name the school district, but I think one had over between seven and 900 students just from the city school district. How do you kind of uh, keep, keep the students here? Cause I think you wanna live in a, you wanna go to, go to school, you wanna have a good education and, and really go where you live. Well, you know what? My, my philosophy is different from most people, as you can already tell through throughout the interview. Mm -hmm. We have to present a better product. And we, we have to show people that the, the I'm going to be honest with you. The majority of the people who, who students leave um, and I call them students because they're not mine. They're not scholars unless they're my district. <laughs> but the majority of them, they leave because of safety. Mm -hmm. that, that's. People don't, we don't talk about that. We, we, we will say academics or testing or F on it, but no, 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 that's not the truth. Because when you look and you really do your due diligence, the majority of places where our students go, their scores are not much better than ours anyway. When you, when you flip this thing and you look at it as a whole, the, the majority of um, test scores for across the state, it doesn't matter what school you go to, is about 40 or 50% proficient. That's not, that's, that may be great when you're, playing baseball or you're putting on the green, but in education, it's not good. So, so when you look at it, the majority of those things are, are really the students who leave are for safety because of perception of safety in our schools. And then you, number two may be, well, they don't get educated as well, but it's, it's, it's always ironic that our schools aren't safe, but the majority of our teachers don't live in our school district. So that means that they come from somewhere else in, in order to teach in a place that's not safe, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because I'm pretty sure if they felt our schools weren't safe, they wouldn't be here to teach for the most part. Well, and, and it, how is, and I'll just ask this straight up, and was it, how safe are the school district? I'm just going to hear it right from your, your mouth because you just brought it up. Right. Our school district, our, our, my school district is safe. I mean, I, it's so safe where when I got here and the first time when I was doing my interview, CEO interview, I had to walk through a metal detector. And the first thing that came to my mind is, that thing has to go. And when I got the CEO job, guess what? That thing left. And, and we have officers in our building and different things like that. Those are things that we have to start transitioning out because it, there, there's a there's a perception of it not being safe, but but we we have safe schools. I mean, we have great administrators. We're, our job is now we're working to build relationships with, with our scholars because we, we, we have to focus on their mental health. Now, when, now, like I said before, out in the public, it's, it's, I mean, there, there's some violence out in a, in a city, but for, for the most part, and I'm often, they don't bring that to school. I always challenge people because we, we talk about the safety of schools, but it's more likely that a mass shooting will happen at a suburban school than it is an urban school. And, and I have yet, and I hope somebody calls me on it because I love to be correct in my information. There hasn't been a mass shooting at an urban school, not, not, not that I know of in, in modern times or really ever. So when we get this thing about safety in, in our schools, it's more likely for a shooting to actually happen in a suburban school than it is in, in a city school. So that that's something that we we I wish we would take the focus off of safety and really do that. And you brought up a point. We have over ten thousand students who live in the city in the city's district, but only forty eight hundred of them go to our district. 
and, and cut me off because I'm, res I'm respecting your show. I'm getting into politics really quick. There's a bill right now that's called the backpack law. And it's, and you know what? It's not only going to tear up Youngstown, it's going to tear up all school districts. So basically the new backpack law is you pick what school you want to go to no matter where you are. So if you're in Canfield and you want to go to Boardman, you and your money goes to Boardman. You pick. But the issue that, that I have with situations like that is we get a lot of our scholars who go to charters or we, they go to a parochial school. Well, after about two weeks, if, if they do something wrong, they and they, they make them come back. We have to take them. But and, and since they've been funded at that school, those funds don't come back with them. So that that's not fair to us. And then or if a student is not academically sound at at one of those, at the, at, like at that school, you said it has 900 kids. They send them back to us. Guess what? After a full academic year, we have to take their test scores back. But those are those are things that people don't talk about because before it only affected a school district like Youngstown. But now that it's affecting the Canfield, the Boardmans, the Camels, it, you're going to see you're going to see a different type of protest than you did before. Because first of all, the, the, the law doesn't it, it doesn't make sense constitutionally because I thought we had something called the separation of, of church and state. But now we're paying full tuition in, in in this case for students to go to I'm not picking on go to a parochial school that that doesn't make sense that that I don't think that's what our framers intended when they when when we started this educational process but I digress and I'm sorry about my political rant there no you're you're fine you're fine well I think we look at a couple different things is the restructuring mm -hmm. I I think because you're moving everything so fast so quickly and the information that came out, people like you're going to be redrawing lines mm -hmm. and you're going to you're going to be redrawing basically everything except um, telling you uh, telling you what, what's for lunch. <laughs> um, and, and I think and I think what what happens is, is they there's so much change so rapidly every so often and you you have this plan. What made you come up with this restructuring plan? Well, actually, the restructuring plan came out of it was birthed out of our working through our strategic plan. So we worked through our strategic plan. And since I've been here, our, um, I, I, I spend a lot of time with our students. I spend time with our, our teachers. I spend time with our community because, I, I mean, like I said, I'm, a, I'm an outsider. I'm not a Youngstowner. I, I call it a Youngstonian. I'm not a Youngstonian. So I, I, I had to learn the lay of the land and learn the politics and different things like that. And, and that's what came out of a lot of our strategic plans is, you know, we, we would like to have our middle schools back. This is why. And so it was kind of birthed out of there. This is not a process that we just started. We actually started this process last year and we talked about it last year. And I've been talking about it since then, about moving towards having middle schools. And like like we said, from a curriculum standpoint, it's, it's perfect for us. And, and, and it works. It works for, for our scholars. And, and we want to be as specific. That's why we're so specific and so finite with, with what we're doing. We want to be very specific with that. We have a different philosophy when it comes to our um, alternative school. We don't want to have a traditional alternative school where our students go there and they're sentenced to alternative school for life. So we have a structure in which when they go to alternative school, they're, they're working on at the same pace and the same curriculum as, as they would in the classroom. So now at a natural time, when, when everything is right, we transition them back into the school that they're supposed to be in. And I think that's the way it should be. That's the way the, the, the successful schools do it. And that's the way it should be for us as well. And, and I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. So the restructuring plan is something that, that at some point it had to start. And so we announced it. We announced the, 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 the plan back in April, but gave the specifics later on because one of the things that I try to do is build my relationship with our staff. And I didn't want the staff to learn from the media. I wanted them to learn from us. So we met with every single building and and, and every single person who were going to be affected. So if you were a principal who were moving, if you were a teacher who were moving, we wanted to meet with them first. And then once we got the information to them, then we then we wanted the public to understand what was going on. Because there's always, when, when you do things like this, there's always things that you can learn or you can learn from what happened before. So you talked about when we he made the transition before. Well, one of the things that happened before is you had a student who lived across the street from Taft, but because of the way the lines were drawn, they had to go all the way across, you know, they had to go four miles to a different school because that's where the line was, was drawn. So we wanted to make sure when we looked at those things, we were saying to the parent, hey, I know you live right behind Taft. So have them walk right over to Taft. We're not going to put him on a bus to go anywhere else. So we had to make sure we took those 
things in, in, into consideration as well. Well, when you did the line drawings, you're actually you're currently ninth and 11th uh, grades at East and Cheney will still go to those schools no matter how the lines are drawn right Correct. now just to kind of to make sure that there, there really isn't change that really affects the boundary changes. Right. Well, when you, you know, it's interesting when you draw lines, you, you, we use census data. And, and one of the issues that we, we have not with census, but one of the issues we have is we have some areas where there's a lot of students in, in this particular area. Then we have other areas where there's hardly any students. So that that's kind of where, where it gets convoluted. But the reason why we allow the students to stay in the school that they were at, I don't think it's, a it's, it's fair for us to transition those students somewhere else. If you started in Cheney and that's where you wanted to be, you should be able to stay in Cheney. I mean, but those other students who are, who are transitioning from the eighth grade, there it, it's a little different. And then you, you get a little different when you have one student who's in the seventh, eighth grade and another student who's in the 10th grade and the 10th grader started at Cheney, but now they're in East's neighborhood. So the, the, the ninth grader is an ace um, at, at East and then the 10th grader is at Cheney. So those are things, I mean, we're working through as well. We, we have a process called um, um, extraordinary transfers in which they can use and, and it goes there. And then, and I get in trouble when I do this, but I'm an athlete, so I don't have a choice. So also from an athletic standpoint, if you started at East in the ninth grade and we did, and we changed the boundaries and you, and you go to Cheney, you can't play at East. You have to sit out a year. So we had to consider that as well. So that's that's Ohio, um, the Ohio Athletic Association, High School Athletic Association rule. So we wanted to make sure we took that into consideration as well. Well, I think it, it, we, we talk a little bit about that because uh, as a basketball official, I've refed at Cheney and East. And, and I'll be very honest, every time I go there, I'm welcome arms. Kids are great. Faculty or faculty and staff are great. Uh, basketball coaches are great. Um, both uh, the boys and girls, all great. Treat the kids well. Nothing but respect when I go there. I've had uh, it's just I I that's me personally. I I have I've gone and visited at least the last ten years. You know what? I, I so I'm so happy you made the connection because I'm like I'm terrible with names and we I know we've never met before, but I knew your face looked. I was like his face looks familiar. And I, I figured maybe I saw you in a grocery store or something, but now now it makes sense. I knew your face looked familiar. Yeah, the the last game I had at at East was the Cheney East game on TV. Oh yeah, uh, that those, those, you know what those are the backyard games you love mm -hmm. when the community can come together. Yeah, I get yelled at. What's the point? I mean, I'm a basketball official. I've been like that for 16 to 20 years. It just we we look at we just we we enjoy we enjoy the game because the as the crowd gets into it, the players get into it, and we get into it with the coaches. Right. And I and I and so we we I look at it that way. And it, but I think one thing, like you said, and I, I'm going to bring this up, and I wasn't going to, but right now we're having. You mentioned it earlier. We're having a lot of violence in the community. Mm -hmm. there, there's a, there's a lot of violence. How do you? I, I know you mentioned a little bit about it, but are you involved in those talks? Are you uh, talking with the police department, the this mayor's office, to kind of help them and guide them? Like, hey, we we can do this in the schools and really talk to the kids and and really talk about talk about that. No, I, I, I will admit I'm, I'm not involved in those talks. I, I, I think we didn't we didn't talk about this. and I think we're staying away from politics. But because of my position as a CEO, it, it's been difficult to be involved in, in those areas because in some areas I'm welcome and in some areas I'm not. So I, I remember my first time, be, my first day being here, I, I had someone tell me that I was a pariah and I was a reason why, you know, things were bad in education and things were bad, you know, that. So I, I, I'm not I'm not often invited in, into those talks unless I invite myself. So I, I have not been involved with those talks, but we do have a great relationship with uh, um, President Trussell, um, uh, Mr. Daly over at Eastern Gateway and, um, and Guy over at the Chamber, uh, Miss Ford down at, at Youngstown Foundation. I spend a lot of time with, with them, but I haven't really been invited into those conversations. It would be nice to, but but and I haven't invited myself. I, I try to I try to stay out of politics because my position my position is not a political position. I, I don't want to be in the center of something and something happens and hey he he you know supported them so we're not going to help the children. So I try to stay out of those things. Well, and and, and I don't blame you. And, and I look at it as just what's what's the right thing to do at the mm -hmm. end of the day. What what is what is that right thing to do to help? the whatever's going on and and i don't care politics aside no matter what no matter what is said or done it's it's what's what's right for the kids at the right. end of the day absolutely 
what what do you see you're making all these changes now will all these changes be done by the fall of this year yep we'll, we'll, we'll start school um right after labor day we're gonna give ourselves a couple extra days right after labor day and everything will be in place place the buildings will be in place they'll be painted and for our scholars and ready to go and technology what do you what do you see as the future? You, you talked about a strategic plan that you guys kind of have formulated. What does the district look like a year, three years down the road? What, what do you see and envision down the road? I, I think you'll see, you, you'll see a, a improved district and you're going to see a district with, that's going to teach a lot more with technology, but also have a lot of hands on. Um, we'll have a lot of more a lot more science engineering, uh, those different things, arts, our arts program, we're expanding our arts program tremendously. We we hired a new VPA coordinator. Be, well, we hired someone to be over the visual and performing arts, which is something we we haven't done. And our, our goal is in the next couple of years to have an instrument in every single scholar's hand. I think that's something that's that's important and they and expose them to those things. So not only um, visual and performing arts, but studio art as well. So that's something you're gonna see that, that will expand. Um, and like we said before, We'll expand our CTE programming down to our middle school ages so they can get a better understanding of that. And and I, I, like I said, I think you'll see an improved district, a more a more uh, robust and organized district as well. Well, that's good to hear. And, and I wish you nothing but the best. And I appreciate you coming on tonight. Thank you for having me. Um, at the end of the show, I like to have some fun with my guests. Are you up for some fun? Absolutely. OK. Uh, so the questions I'm about to ask, it could be a professional or personal. There's really, I like to say there's no right or wrong answer, but uh, I've, I've seen them go far right or far left, depending on the answer. What is your best experience? Um, <clears throat> my best experience, wow. Besides my, besides my children, it would probably, um, I, I, I don't know if I told you this, but I was a struggling learner, a struggling reader as I was growing up. So when I graduated from high school, I was only reading at a third grade level and kind of the reason why I'm so motivated and I probably the reason why I have so many degrees because it helped me kind of, <laughs> it, it helped. <laughs> me. But I think that that's one of, one of my proudest moments, but I, I think probably one of them is really being a turnaround principal and, and, and a basketball coach in which my, my, uh, my, uh, I call them my kids. My kids come back to me and be like, Mr. Jennings, or they'll call me coach. So most of them still call me coach. They'll, they'll be like, coach, I was I was doing this the other day and I was coaching and I said something and I was like, man, I'm saying the same thing that my coach said. And so that I mean, I think those, those are the moments that make you proud when you when you've influenced um, those, those young people and they become adults and, and they're influencing people in the same way. OK, OK. What's your best accomplishment? My best accomplishment is uh, what, absolutely my children. I mean, just I, I'm so proud of my of my children. Like I said, I have a 28 year old and a 21 year old. My daughter is a senior at Michigan State right now, and I'm just so proud of both of them. Okay, what's your best memory? My best memory is growing up in a neighborhood in which uh, my parents worked every day, but we always ate dinner together. That that's something that I just I mean I don't. I didn't grow up with a lot of money, but but we we had we had Brady Bunch characteristics in our house, and we would sit, and my dad would ask us how our day went. I mean, we would we would get in trouble, we would joke. I mean, we we would. I just remember the Kool Aid days. With it depends on who made the Kool Aid. If if my sister made it, it was too sweet. If my brother made it, it had, why did you put lemon in there? And my other brother, why do you always make the blue Kool Aid? I mean, those were the those. Those are the fond memories that I have just growing up. And, and I tried to mimic that in my own family. I always made sure um, that my children ate with me or if, if I wasn't physically there, I cooked for them. So when they got home, there was food for them to at least sit down and eat together with their mom. Uh, that, that was always important to me. Yeah, I, I think you, you, you hit it right on the dinner table is important with the family. Absolutely. It, 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 if you can do it, it, it's very, very important. And I feel that as a baby girl that's coming, I can now announce that we've finally yeah. announced it, that I got a baby girl coming. And um, right. I, I hope to, I know I'm in trouble. I've been you told are. that. <laughs> you are. I was going to say the same thing. You oh, are. Thanks. I just said it ahead of you. Uh -huh. I, I just said it ahead of you. But you know what? I'm, I'm blessed to, I'm blessed. God will give me um, a baby girl and, and, uh, I'm very excited and nervous. I know my wife is excited as, as well. So we'll, 
uh, that baby's due here shortly. So we uh, will be, uh, I'll get, I'll report back to you after, during the basketball season. (laughs) Congrats, congrats. Um, Who's your role model? My dad. Absolutely. My dad. I mean, my dad is a phenomenal man. I think I, I told you my mom passed away in 2013. My mom had a stroke two days after she retired. So she never got Ooh. a chance to enjoy her retirement. And she lived for another almost 10 years. And my dad took care of her every day. When my mom had a stroke, she could not talk. She couldn't walk. She couldn't do anything. And my dad, um, this will make me cry. My dad took care of her, her every day everything. He wouldn't let anybody do anything else because that was his wife and that was his job to do. So it definitely would, I would say both of my parents, but if we had to say right now, it would just be my dad because he's the only one who's here with me. So that's not even, that's a no brainer right there. Okay. And then the last one is, is if you could meet one person past or present, who would it be and why? (laughs) Wow. This is a tough one. These are harder questions than probably the ones I asked you earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, if I could meet one person, you know, I, I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay in my family. I, I've had some phenomenal people in my family. I wish I could have met my great grandfather because I just, I just heard so many great things about him. And just, just, I'm one of those guys who I, I guess I'm old now because I'm, I'm 46, but I'm one of those guys who I consider a young guy with the, with the old soul. And when I was growing up, of course, I played basketball and did those different things, but I used to spend a lot of time around my grandparents because I wanted to learn different things. I, I love to cook, and my love for cooking came from being around my grand, my great grandmother, and my grandmother. So during that time, I heard a lot of stories about my my grand my great grandfather who back back in the early uh, 1900s on on the general store at a time where you know black folk didn't do that. And um, just some of the stories that I heard from my great grandmother is just something I, I would love to be able to, to meet him and kind of, I, I would say pick his brain, but kind of learn because you, I, 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 it's, it's, it was so funny when I'm growing up, my, my mom or my grandmama would say, well, you do this like your grandfather, you do this like your grandfather. It would have been nice to be able to just kind of vi- watch him do those things so I can see like, wow, I do do that like him. Yeah, I, I it, you just want to kind of pick his brain, sit there, have a glass of uh kool-aid next to them and just uh and just and just kind of um really because they're filled with knowledge i mean right. they're they're they've they've gone through a, a great life and, and they're still living their life and and you learn from them i mean i'm i'll be honest like when i was six you know when you're 15 16 17 18 you're like i know it all but then you kind of realize that as you get older you want to listen like any advice you give you can kind of give them and say hey this is what I did. This is what you should be looking at. And, and I listened a little bit and then I had some that, that I didn't, but I I mean, I learned from my parents. I learned from a lot of great mentors of mine and I I get what you mean. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I, I, uh, I remember I sat on the park committee, the rec park and rec commission for the city of Youngstown at one point about 10 years ago. And I always would go to the South side library. They had that little, the, the restaurant, I don't know if they still do because of the pandemic. And there used to be this group of old timers, retirees mm-hmm. that were from the city of Youngstown that had the, just the, this knowledge of you just would, they would just tell these stories of Idora Park of the South side, the, the South Coliseum or the South side basketball midnight league, just the, these stories that you would never hear again. And, and, and it just the knowledge that they have and, and, what the history of this area really is. And right. and I know Grand Rapids has the same history. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, Justin, I appreciate you taking time out of your, out of your uh, busy schedule. I know a lot's going on and, and I thank you for the, for the conversation. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hopefully we'll, we'll be invited back again. We did the right thing. <laughs> Every day, Justin, stay on everyone. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this great conversation with the CEO of the Youngstown City Schools. Hey, you can always call his office. He says he's transparent. He's more than happy to answer any of your questions. So if you want more podcast interviews and announcements, please go to anthonyvspano.com. Everyone stay safe. God bless and good night.